miracle of engineering that can take us virtually anywhere and bring us back alive. But sometimes the air strikes back hard and fast and deadly. Now there's a new breed of helicopter built for the 21st century. Some call them supercopters, and this is one of the best. The Augusta Westland EH-101. How does this mechanical marvel defy gravity and rule the sky? Somewhere off the coast of Italy, a man is drowning. One of the most advanced helicopters ever built is racing to his rescue. The Augusta Westland EH-101. It's designed for an emergency like this. Its rotor blades are revolutionary. They're driven by three of the most sophisticated engines ever made. And it's huge, almost 75 feet from nose to tail and tipping the scales at 15 tons. A giant that can range 900 miles out into the open sea at a top speed of almost 200 miles an hour. And when it finds its man, it can fight winds of over 50 miles an hour to hover rock steady in the sky, saving seconds in a race where death holds the stopwatch. To the Italian Navy's Flying Shark Squadron, it's a deadly serious training mission. But to the EH-101, this is child's play. It's one of the new generation supercopters that are taking our 21st century skies by storm. The Sikorsky S-92 NH Industries NH90 and the Augusta Westland EH101. This American version of the EH101, known as the US101, was chosen by the US Navy as the next presidential helicopter. Designated Marine One, creating the Oval Office in the sky will be a joint venture of three firms. Augusta Westland, Bell Helicopters, and Lockheed Martin. It will truly be a supercopter. But no matter how advanced, the flight of any helicopter is governed by three major components. Call it the rule of three. The main rotor. The engines. And the tail rotor. Three components that have to work together for a helicopter to fly. And this is what the rule of three can achieve. The EH-101 moves through the air like a hummingbird. A 15-ton hummingbird. 
It's precisely because helicopters like the EH-101 can do what no other aircraft can do, can go where no other aircraft can go, can reach places we can reach by no other means, that we've come to depend on them. But when even one component in the rule of three fails, flying machines can become killing machines. In normal conditions, Flying a helicopter is only slightly more dangerous than flying a regular fixed-wing aircraft of the same size. But we did not create the helicopter for the easy jobs of flight. It was made to operate in the outer envelope of risk. And sometimes we push the helicopter too far. The simple but mysterious truth is that the helicopter is a flying machine that doesn't want to fly. That it flies at all is close to a mechanical miracle. A helicopter sitting on the ground is actually more capable of beating itself to death by rolling over and the blades thrashing around in the air than it is of actually flying. The first component in the helicopter's rule of three is its main rotor. Fixed-wing aircraft fly because of the way air naturally flows over their wings as the plane moves forward. They are literally pulled through the air. A helicopter's rotors act like spinning wings. As air moves through them, the rotors lift it up tugging the bird into the sky. And the main rotor doesn't just lift the helicopter, it also propels it forward by driving air backward. Every second the EH-101 is in flight, its massive main rotor is shoving up to 45 tons of air out of its way. 15 tons of aircraft, suspended from five spinning wings. The EH-101's main rotor is an engineering miracle that took decades to perfect. But the story of the rotor is about more than engineering. It's an invention that has changed history. The rotor would come of age in a time of war. And our skies would never be the same. Creating helicopters as advanced as today's supercopters is like creating a robot that can dance. It took us almost as long to solve the mysteries of vertical flight as it did to reach the moon. In 15th century Renaissance Italy, Leonardo da Vinci imagined a flying machine that would twist its way up into the heavens like a screw turning through wood. But the scientific trail to today's supercopters wouldn't involve a screw, but a whirling rotor blade. It's the first and most important component of the rule of three that governs all helicopter flight. Early rotor blades were made of wood, spinning airfoils that achieved lift, but not much more. But over decades of development, rotors became more versatile and more robust, 
finally propelling the helicopter from the sidelines of flight to the center stage of conflict. A conflict that would last 20 years and involve 3 million American soldiers. The Vietnam War. But it wasn't until the Vietnam War that the helicopter came of age. That's when there were hundreds, if not thousands, of helicopters deployed in one battle zone. Dominating the skies of the Vietnam War was Bell Helicopters UH-1 Huey. It was the world's first supercopter, the first US military helicopter powered by a jet turbine engine with perhaps the strongest rotor blades in existence. The first time I ever sat in a Huey helicopter and pulled the stick, it was like it fell up. It just had this sudden power up. It was an amazing thing. Although all metal rotors had been fitted to earlier helicopters, the Huey's thick 44-foot-long blade set a new standard for toughness. It could take small arms fire from any conceivable direction and usually survive quite well. Bob Mason is a legendary Vietnam War pilot whose book Chicken Hawk tells his and the Huey's incredible story of war and survival. I remember one time I had to be the last ship out. So I had to take everybody with me. And everybody got on board, and there was one more guy than I thought we could carry. And I couldn't leave the one guy. His Huey dangerously overloaded. Bob Mason had only one way out. But it meant flying straight toward a jungle thicket. So I headed for that thicket, hoping to accelerate enough to get over it. But I didn't, and I had to go through it. So here's a machine that can go through the thicket, chopping off the tops of these small branches with the rotor system, with six or seven screaming American soldiers in the back. <laughs> I mean, I love this machine. <laughs> if the Huey was the supercopter of the 20th century, the EH-101 is chasing that title into the 21st. And just like the Vietnam-era Huey, this supercopter's main rotor blade is a primary reason for its success. But while the Huey's rotors were all metal, the core of the EH-101's blades is paper. Using state-of-the-art technology and composite materials like carbon and glass fiber, these rotors are much lighter and more durable than all metal blades. A core of honeycomb paper is combined with pieces of foam, carved to precise dimensions. They're wrapped with layer after layer of composite fiber material, then baked in a pressurized chamber to become as hard as steel. Finished with titanium edges, they're as battle-ready as a blade can be. When a bullet hits an all-metal rotor, it sends fractures through the entire width of the blade. But when a composite blade takes a hit, the interwoven fibers around the bullet hole are undamaged. And this is what really sets this rotor blade apart, a wing tip. This feature has virtually solved two of the main problems helicopters suffer. Rotor noise, which can warn an enemy of a helicopter's approach. And brownout, dust storms that can blind a pilot during desert takeoffs and landings. Jobs don't come much tougher for a helicopter than pulling hostages out of hostile territory, especially when that territory is a desert. And no hostage rescue mission is more infamous than the ill-fated Desert One in 1980 to rescue U.S. citizens being held in Iran. 
It became helicopter hell in the desert, ending in the deaths of eight American servicemen. But if that mission had to be carried out today with one of the new breed of supercopters, it might have ended differently. One of a helicopter's greatest handicaps during a rescue operation like Desert One is the noise made by its rotors. The enemy can hear it coming. Most rotor noise is caused by the tips of the helicopter's blades moving through the air at supersonic speed. The telltale beating sound is actually a series of mini sonic booms created by the rotor tips. That's where these wing-tipped rotor blades have a killer advantage. Their wing shape allows the rotor tips to spin more slowly and yet still achieve the same lift and thrust. Because the rotor tips don't create the sonic boom effect, the pilots who flown the EH-101 in battle say it's one of the quietest helicopters flying. One of the biggest problems we face is detection. The ability of this aircraft is to arrive relatively silently on the target until literally seconds before we're there. Mike Stangroom is a pilot with the British Royal Air Force's 28th Squadron. He captains their newest asset, the EH-101 we can go alone and unafraid into hostile territory in confidence. The men of the 28th Squadron train relentlessly for rescue missions behind enemy lines. Timing, positioning, and speed must come together. Most of all, it's stealth the key to the success or failure of the mission. The end game is what our job is all about. And there may be enemy on the scene, it might be a hot target. If the enemy hears them coming, the landing might not just be hot, but fatal. EH-101's wing-tipped rotors allow it to carry a rescue force through hostile skies virtually undetected. Giving them the advantage of surprise in a game of life and death. The rescue force finds its target. Hello, Rapier 1, this is Havoc 01, radio check over. And calls the lead EH 101 in for the extraction. Havoc 01, okay. Uh, packaging casualty. Guys, one minute. But if this rescue was for real, and if it was happening in a desert environment, like that faced by the Desert One mission in Iran, the helicopter and the men it's carrying would be facing a danger as great as enemy fire. Sandstorms created by the rotor blades, called brownouts, which can blind pilots on takeoff and landing, are a major cause of helicopter crashes. The EH-101's wing-tipped rotors deal with the desert sands in a way even their developers didn't expect. 
Unlike other rotor blades, the wingtips focus the main force of their downwash at the outside edge of what's called the rotor disc, carving a window of clear air through the brownout, which allows the pilot to see the ground on the way down. It's called the donut effect. The pilot flies in that hole. He has excellent visibility for 90% of the approach. And in the critical stages, he can see his landing point very easily. And what works for sand works equally for snow. The wingtip rotors defeat whiteout just as effectively as brownout. But however advanced the EH-101's rotor might be, it would be nothing without what's under the hood and on its tail. Without a powerful engine and a tail rotor to control its movement, no helicopter can survive. The rule of three pits physics against the forces of nature. And when the parts all work together, a helicopter can do things even Leonardo couldn't predict. Beneath the whirling blades of the EH-101 lies the beating heart of this flying machine. 6,000 horsepower drives 15 tons of aircraft into the sky. The second component of the rule of three, the gas turbine jet engine. And it doesn't have just one, it has three. Each is about the same size as the engine of a family car, but each packs 10 times the punch. But while jet engines on fixed-wing aircraft provide forward thrust in a helicopter, all that power goes into turning the rotor blades. It's like a giant propeller. The spinning rotor drives the helicopter through the air. The engine's job is to keep the rotor spinning at exactly the same speed, no matter how strong the wind or what the aircraft is trying to do. It's like asking a car engine to maintain the exact speed no matter how steep the hill. The engines must not stall. They must not slow down. They have to keep the rotor spinning no matter how aggressively the helicopter is being thrown through the sky. And the 21st century engines that power the new generation supercopters can do just that. They enable the kind of power flying that would not have been possible with older generation engines. Air Force's 28th Squadron is on a training mission. Their task, to stalk and intercept a speeding car. These men are playing the role of escaping terrorists. Positioning high above, the EH-101s drop into a near vertical dive. They swoop in a mere 50 feet off the ground, traveling at nearly 200 miles an hour. Then the aircraft snaps into an incredible aerial switchback. Its engines absorb the shock of this maneuver without missing a beat. The copter hits the ground in a maelstrom of dust. This is shock and awe, helicopter style. Designed to terrify and confuse the targets of the intercept and allow their capture and arrest by the special forces troops who storm from the belly of the beast. A 
mere 50 feet off the ground, traveling at nearly 200 miles an hour. Then the aircraft snaps into an incredible aerial switchback. Its engines absorb the shock of this maneuver without missing a beat. The copter hits the ground in a maelstrom of dust. This is shock and awe, helicopter style. Designed to terrify and confuse the targets of the intercept and allow their capture and arrest by the special forces troops who storm from the belly of the beast. Within seconds, it's all over. All that's left is an empty car and an empty sky. The secret to this maneuver is the sheer power and computer-managed precision of the EH-101's engines. Deconstruct how they work. Watch this again. First, the initial dive. The copter drops almost straight down. Its rotor blades are spinning at a steady 214 RPM, but they're not actually pushing much air. For the engines, this is the easy part. 50 feet from the ground, the copters level out for their attack run. The rotors are biting hard into the air, forcing air backwards to propel the EH-101 at its top speed of nearly 200 miles an hour. The engines have to take the strain and keep the rotors spinning at exactly the same rate of 214 RPM despite their extra workload. Every movement of the rotor blades is communicated directly to the engines by the helicopter's onboard computers. But the moments approaching that will set these engines apart from all that have gone before. This extraordinary aerial switchback from top speed to a dead stop and back again. The trick for me is to get the aircraft turned around through 180 degrees and to lose what could be up to 180 miles an hour to zero in a very short distance. As you'll appreciate, that's a very aggressive maneuver. The main rotors are fighting the air, first to stop the aircraft, then turn it around, then to bring it down fast. It's an enormous shock to the rotor blades and it's transferred directly to the engines. If the engines stall, as older generation engines might, the 15-ton aircraft would fall from the sky. But the EH-101's engines absorb the shock of the switchback and keep the rotor spinning at a constant rate, pulling it through its violent 180-degree turn. And in the event that one of the EH-101's engines is shot out or fails, its onboard computers will alert the remaining two engines to make up the power difference and allow the aircraft not only to continue flying, but to continue with its mission. Of course, on the battlefield, huge amount of redundancy uh, and reliability, because you can take battle damage, lose an engine, and still carry on with the mission. Most of the weight early helicopters were actually lifting was the weight of their heavy and underpowered piston engines. 
the development of the lighter but immensely more powerful gas turbine jet engine in the 1950s allowed helicopters to lift much greater loads. What had been an aerial gymnast was now also a beast of burden, transporting up to 40 tons through the air. And while the EH-101 is not designed to be a heavyweight lifter, it can still carry a truck or pack 50 evacuees into its cargo area. And most importantly, its three computer-controlled engines allow it to hover rock solid in winds over 50 miles an hour. It's a critical advantage when an entire squad of troops needs to be delivered quickly to a battlefield. In the rule of three that governs all helicopter flight, the main rotor provides lift and propulsion. The engine, constant power. But without one more critical component, even the latest supercopters would spin uncontrollably through the sky. It's the final engineering secret to the helicopter's success, the tail that wags the dog. And when something goes wrong with this part, look out. Heavy weather, high octane jet fuel, and a 15 ton helicopter hovering above the deck of a warship at sea. This British Royal Navy EH-101 is about to refuel without landing on the ship. It's one of the most difficult maneuvers a helicopter can be asked to do, and few are asked to do it. But this is just the sort of high-risk operation supercopters are designed for, saving precious time that would be taken up by landing to refuel. Its key role is force protection to remain airborne 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, searching out the surface threat from ships and the subsurface threat from submarines. During this refueling, the EH-101 maintains a precisely controlled hover. Powerful gas turbine engines drive five of the most advanced rotor blades ever created, keeping it rock steady in the air. But guiding it closer and closer to the ship and the waiting fuel line is the third component in the rule of three that governs all helicopter flight. It's whirling tail rotor. Five thousand tons of ship, 15 tons of helicopter, are now connected by a hose full of volatile aviation fuel. There's no margin of error. But the EH-101 doesn't deviate in the air. thanks to the precision guidance of its tail rotor. The tail rotor is absolutely fundamental to the flight of helicopters. If you like, it's the tail which wags the dog. C2, if, as some people have contended, we were supposed to take Charlie 3, that taxiway takes you right back into the terminal area. All of the taxiways on that terminal were blocked, so we'd have not been anywhere, we'd have had to just wait there again. Feeling that the Charlie 3 taxiway must not be their intended destination, the Pan Am crew calls the tower again for clarification. The third one said one, two, three, the third, third one. Since their jet is already past the first exit, in telling them to take the third exit, the crew believes the tower intends for them to exit at C4, the third exit from C1. The other airplane had done the very same thing. It was the logical taxiway to get off the runway on. 
So uh, we all felt very confident that that was the taxiway that we were supposed to depart the runway on. And then, just when things are teetering dangerously out of control, fate strikes. A thick fog suddenly descends on the airfield. And I looked out the window and I said to Suzanne, we're not going anywhere. I can't even see the number two engine, which is the inboard engine. I knew our regulations at Pan Am. We, we would not be going anywhere. It was too foggy. Yeah, we expected so to go to the... Back to hole. wherever we, yeah. <laughs> we had been sitting. The island has a reputation of very quickly fogging in. And the visibility went from unlimited down to 500 meters, which is about 1,500 feet. And we could just barely see the runway in front of the nose. And at the same time, looking for our taxiway that we were supposed to turn off to the left to, to clear the active runway and to get uh, off the runway and into position back of the KLM. Like many small single runway airports, Tenerife was not equipped with ground radar, allowing air traffic controllers to monitor aircraft on the field. But even as the airfield is enveloped by fog, the decision to go ahead with takeoff remains in place. That particular runway, as most runways are, were very highly painted to give you the center line, and we were barely able to see the runway. And the captain had slowed the airplane down to like three knots, just barely moving. We were just beginning to see the curved directional lines to take us off on the Charlie Four, which was the taxiway we were looking for. Having lost sight of the KLM and the Pan Am jets, the tower now seeks to get verbal confirmation on the relative location of both planes on the runway. KLM 4805, how many taxiway uh, did you pass? I think uh, we just passed Charlie Ford now. Both cockpit crews and the air traffic controllers are now working outside of their comfort zones. Okay, at the end of the runway, make 180 and report. Uh, ready for ATC clearance. The KLM reaches the end of the runway and turns 180 degrees. What happens next is an extraordinary exchange between pilot and co-pilot. This is the KLM cockpit conversation taken from the transcripts. Wait a minute. We did not have ATC clearance yet. No, I know that. Go ahead and ask. This exchange suggests that Von Janten had begun to take off until his co-pilot reminds him that he did not have clearance. This is an unusual interaction as Von Janten, the senior officer, was not used to having his judgment questioned in his own cockpit. Democracy in the cockpit is a very cultural issue. There are some culture that they are basically very high in power distance, meaning that there is a very strong hierarchy and very steep hierarchy in their society. They cannot expect they have a democracy in the cockpit. Von Janten waits impatiently for further instructions from ground control. The KLM 4805 is now ready for takeoff. Um, and we're waiting for our ATC clearance. It's a routing clearance that uh, air traffic control gives the departing plane that basically tells him how to go from one airport, your departure point, to your destination. Report, uh, ready for ATC clearance. But even ATC, or air traffic control clearance, is only a confirmation of the in-flight route to be taken. Clearance to actually take off must be given separately. It is these next few moments of communication between the tower and the two planes that will forever be analyzed. All right, Roger, sir. We are cleared to the Papa Beacon flight level 90. We heard the KLM uh, pilot read the clearance pack, which is required. As soon as he finished reading the ATC clearance back, he added a comment that was totally unexpected to us. And we're now at Take off. Okay, stand by for takeoff. I will call you. But we were still taxing down, assuming 
that KLM was going to be holding his position as he was directed to do. And that's when I got on the radio and said, but we're still on the runway. 1736, report one runway clear. Von Jonten again begins the takeoff. If there were any further objections in his cockpit, the transcripts do not reveal them. The huge, fully fueled jumbo jet begins to pick up speed. The point of no return has now been passed. When we first saw the KLM airplane, it wasn't of great concern because we knew he was down there. Then I noticed his landing lights were on, and I saw his light shaking. And then that's when I said, I think he's moving. Is he not at all done? Yes, excellent. Is he not at all? They're born American. Yeah, well. I could see his rotating beacon, and he lifted off. Now, do something. Pull back, him. Pull back. I just could not believe that this airplane was taking off, coming right at us. On a fog-bound runway, two 747 jumbo jets desperately attempt to escape each other's path. But it's too late. And I said, he's moving, get off, to the captain. He went to full power on the throttles. We were only going three knots, so the airplane was moving very slowly. I think I must have said a very short prayer. I hope he misses us. And that's when I just closed my eyes and ducked. And then suddenly there was this thud, this tremendous impact. Joan jumped up, ran to her door, looked out the, the window, and yelled, fire on the wing. The entire top of the fuselage was severed. If you look at uh, the window of the airplane, those windows were gone, and the entire top of the airplane was gone. So what I did uh, when I decided to leave, and I was yelling at everybody to get out, I stood up on the foot of the cockpit floor that was remaining and uh, reached over and grabbed the back of the captain's seat, Victor Grubb's seat, and then just jumped right over the side. I continued making my way down through this um, bits of the fuselage and, and uh, things and got about five feet or so. There was an edge, a precipice about five feet tall, and there was a group of passengers there, eight maybe eight or 10 passengers. And I started pushing them, saying, you know, jump, jump. We have to get out of here. And then the debris shifted again. And then everybody, all of us, were just kind of leaping to try to get away from where the debris was shifting. Because the engines now were spewing all the metals. They were disintegrating so severely. No one got out of the airplane past row 33 reason for that was when KLM hit us, he severed his landing gear into our airplane. Matter of fact, they found his landing gear, uh, the main landing gear, in our wreckage. After escaping the Pan Am wreck, passenger David Wiley borrowed another survivor's camera to take these two extraordinary photos in the immediate aftermath of the crash. So I went up and I started yelling at them for jump, and they did. Everybody just came straight off and uh, hitting a large group on the ground. One man, I noticed, grabbed uh, a lady by the ankle and just started running as fast as he could. Turned out later that uh, the lady that was being drugged across the ground was the wife of the man that was pulling her. And when she hit, all of the other people hit on front of on top of her and broke her back, both arms and both legs. Fifteen hundred feet further down the runway, what was left of the KLM flight lay smoldering. The full tank of fuel turned the jet into a bonfire of twisted metal. Not one of the 248 people on board survived. And I think that was our first thought. That was that our first thought. It was thought. a bomb. And we were astonished when someone pointed out that there was another plane down the runway on fire. We had no idea. 
In the chaos of the aftermath, rescue workers never made it to the Pan Am site in time to aid injured survivors. I recall walking around to the passengers who were on the ground, who had been able to evacuate, who were clearly injured, and trying to lean down and reassure them, I'd say, don't worry, the ambulances are coming, help is on the way, the emergency equipment will be here soon. And meanwhile, we never saw any emergency equipment. We never saw ambulances or fire trucks. What had happened was, when KLM hit us, the soldier's landing gear exploded and hit 1,500 feet down the runway. His site was closer to the tower than ours was. The tower called both of us and couldn't get any return communication. And about the same time, a airplane in the holding pattern right above the airport called the tower and said that he saw fire and wreckage on his runway. The fire trucks and ambulances come out and they get to KLM first. So this is why no one came out to our site. About that time, the center fuel tank of the airplane, which is located uh, right under the uh, wing as it joins the fuselage down in that area, the center fuel tank exploded and shot a flame probably two or 300 feet up into the air. It strikes me as very ironic that if there was fire equipment there uh, trying to put out the fire at KLM, if only they'd known there were potential survivors at our plane that if they'd been able to get there, it might have, might have helped. The final toll is horrific. Of the 380 passengers on the Pan Am flight, only 54 survived their injuries. Every one of the 248 people on the KLM flight perish in the accident. Shortly after the, the accident, uh, it was much too emotional to talk about it. And it, to Suzanne and I, it didn't feel respectful of the people who had lost their lives. We wanted mm. not to gloat we were still alive, you know. What sense can be made of such devastation? Is there anything to be learned from the kind of impossible tragedy represented by Tenerife? Root causes for the catastrophe at Tenerife are manifold. The University of Southern California School of Engineering is home to an internationally famous aviation safety research and training program. Dr. Najmadeen Mashkadi focuses on human error factors. When you look at the contributing factors of Tenerife, which we were able to identify like nine or 10 human factors related contributing factors. At the end of the day, in its core is a human factors problem. I know, I know The that. culture inside the that. KLM cockpit would prove to be the most closely analyzed set of human errors attributed to the crash. One of the biggest problems that was raised in the case of KLM at the Tenerife was that Captain Van Zanten, because of his personality, he was like a chief pilot, the poster boy pilot for the KLM, and that it was very hard to disagree with him. Cultural factors can play a tremendous role within the cockpit, between the pilot and co-pilot, and between the cockpit and air traffic controller their interaction. As you see that, you, you are really at the mercy of cultural factors. They say that they're off. They're Paul American. <laughs> yeah, and as it turned out, it was actually the flight engineer, this is the third in command in the, on the flight deck, who actually questioned whether the Pan American airplane was off the runway. He was the only one who did. And the captain responded that, yes, he was emphatically that he was off the runway. While the consequences of human dynamics at Tenerife will long be debated, other failures are more cut and dry. One critical but little discussed root cause has been attributed to a common technical glitch in radio communications. Okay, stand by for takeoff, I will call you. I responded by keying the mic and saying, we are still on the runway. Roger Alpha, 1736, report when runway clear. Tragically, Robert Bragg's urgent message that his 747 is still on the runway and in the direct path of the KLM 747 is never clearly received. He goes unheard because of a radio frequency phenomenon known as the heterodyne effect. 
Patrick Smith is a commercial airline pilot and author. Most of the time, pilots communicate via a two-way VHF radio. And the way that works is a, a crew member or an air traffic controller picks up a microphone or uh, using the headset and uh, the hand switch on the yoke, clicks the mic, makes the transmission, releases the mic, and waits for an acknowledgement or, uh, in pilot speak, a readback. Free Golf Charlie's ready at uh, Foxtrot 25 left. Free Golf Charlie, runway 25 left, position hold. Position hold 25 left, Free Golf Charlie. The trouble arises when two or more transmissions are made at the same time. They effectively cancel each other out, and the result is a prolonged squeal or uh, just a hail of static. What happened to Tenerife is that two very critical transmissions that effectively could have prevented the accident were made at the same instant, were blocked out, and nobody caught it. There are units that can be put into airline transport uh, radios that won't allow heterodynes to occur. And for the most part, they haven't been installed. And that's not to say that there's a crisis at hand where there are you know, airplanes waiting to crash into each other all the time. It's been 30 years and it hasn't happened. And with uh, 40,000 or so airplanes taking off, commercial airplanes taking off around the world every day, the record speaks for itself. That said, it's an easy fix. Why not do it? The catastrophe that happened at Tenerife has a technical name, incursion. The Federal Aviation Administration defines a runway incursion as a collision or a near miss involving two planes either trying to land or take off. The Tenerife incursion might be the worst in history, but it will not be the last. From the last report I heard, there are still something like 300 runway incursions that occur every year throughout the world. In my case, I had never had a runaway incursion until the Tenerife accident. But one was enough, and another will be one too many. In the history of flight, mid-air near collisions are rare. However, near misses between planes where at least one of them is on the ground has become an almost daily occurrence. There was another accident six years after the Tenerife disaster at Madrid involving a collision, ground collision between a DC-9 and a Boeing 727. There was not a major ground collision after that until uh, the accident at uh, Lainete Airport at serving Milan in October of 2001. A Cessna Citation business type jet was cleared to taxi to the end of the runway and in, in, in doing so actually taxi the opposite direction and crossed the runway in which a, um, an MD-87 jet was taking off. The runway incursion at Lanate bears a strong resemblance to Tenerife. Both airports are notorious for fog and neither at the time had operating ground radar. Runway incursions are a focus of research and development for Rattan Katwa at the Honeywell Aviation Firm. From the cockpit of an incoming plane at Los Angeles International Airport, he demonstrates just what pilots are up against navigating routine air traffic control signals on any given flight. As we near the runway, two potentially dangerous situations occur. First, our call sign was very similar to the call sign for another plane. Did you hear there was a three Charlie Charlie? Yeah, on the uh, frequency. Uh, it just gave me the idea. Our call sign is three Golf Charlie. What we heard on the radio on the same frequency was a very, very similar call sign, three to Charlie Charlie. Um, this problem or this issue of similar call signs has in fact been a, a component in previous runway incursions. Next, something which could easily compound confusion about our call sign, a last minute change to our runway. Can three call Charlie, change the runway 25 right, you're clear to land, one 2507. Can three call Charlie, runway 25 right, clear to land. The last moment on final approach, the tower controller asked us to in fact sidestep to land on the, the, the other parallel runway. And this, of course, can set up a, an environment where the workload is high, stress can be high, and in other words, it can certainly lead to, to a situation where a runway incursion could potentially be caused. 
Our confusing landing sequence at LAX illustrates why many believe high-tech map displays and situational advisory systems should be standard issue on commercial aircraft. But others feel technology isn't a silver bullet solution. A TV screen style monitor shows a graphical depiction of where your airplane is relative to other airplanes on the ground and in flight. Something like that, had it been there at Tenerife, um, may have prevented the accident from happening. Skylane 6530, Mike, and 25 right for a straight out departure. Sometimes this technology is more fancy than it needs to be, and you know, there are so many. Uh, multiple oral warnings and color-coded depictions. Sometimes they use more gray matter than a, than a pilot has uh, at his disposal at a given time. You know, studies show that when a crew's workload is either too high or too low, performance suffers. In 1977, a lethal combination of human error, foggy weather, technological malfunction, and overcrowding on the runway lead to the single most deadly aviation disaster in history. Every event leading to the Tenerife catastrophe could happen again at almost any airport today. Have the broader lessons of Tenerife been fully comprehended three decades after the crash? When you look at the number of landing and takeoffs which is going on around the world, at all these different airports, I think another Tenerife is not that improbable. General flying public, they have this fixation. They see a better, shinier, more modern technology. They think it's a, it's a panacea. But it's really not. If you have fog, if you have uh, uh, airport geometry, which is awkward. If you are under the time pressure, if you have a ground radar that's not operating, if you have a problem with situational awareness in your cockpit crew, be careful. I think if you went up to 100 people and said, what does Tenerife mean? Maybe seven or eight of them would know what you were talking about. But the lessons learned, um, you know, have been applied. Runway incursions uh, and, and near misses, as they're uh, misleadingly called sometimes, you know, have been on the increase. But in a way, that's a symptom of there just being so many more planes and so many more people flying. There was a study commissioned that came to show that flying in 2006 is about five or six times safer than it was in 1980. I learned from this accident, you just cannot get into a hurry in an airplane. Now, that's common nature to do that. If uh, you're running late, you have to come up with some type of procedure to get, get yourself calmed down and just say, hey, we're gonna, stop, we're gonna stop the airplane if we have to until this stuff gets right. Well, when I flew down here, um, I had the very last row in the back with, in the middle of a family and there were two seats open up by the exit, and I said to the flight attendant, are those two seats open and may I move? And she said, are you willing and able to help in an evacuation? I said, yes. <laughs> and then she said, you can open the exit and assist people out. I said, I've done it.